So just as I start the conversation, uh, I wanted to give a bit of a quick introduction to the vision of why I wanted to talk about the subject that, uh, that I'll ask in this, in this session. Uh, so for me, being in the background of Aikido, the emphasis on the personal development, uh, what's sometimes called spirituality, which I have a bit of a problem with now. But besides that, um, it's, it was emphasized very much. And uh, as I come to combat sports, sometimes it's emphasized, not always, but I definitely see great people appearing, especially after some BGJ practice and MMA practice, but not always. Uh, so since you're uh, such an experienced expert in, in all these realms, I'm just very curious to know how you see the whole relationship between uh, martial, art, martial arts, combat sports, and just personal growth, personal development. So, so I'm really looking forward to ask you those questions and to, to learn about your perspective. Yeah, you bet. Great. So uh, the first one, the very first question is, what do you personally feel makes martial arts or combat sports, it can be either both or one of those specifically or as separate realms, uh, what do you feel makes them unique as a tool for personal development? Why, why a person could invest himself in this realm rather than something else like yoga or, or just leadership or anything? Right. Well, um, there's a couple things. The first one is I think that physical activity is whether we're talking about uh, competitive athletic sports, um, mountain climbing, surfing. These kind of activities can definitely lead to what Abraham Maslow, you know, uh, classified as a peak experience. And there's a very famous quote from um, Joseph Campbell where he talked about how the only peak experience he ever, ever had his entire life, where another way to say that would be, you know, the only real spiritual experience he ever had his entire mm. life came as a result of athletics. Mm. So athletics in and of itself can, can become a vehicle for people to – get into the flow, to focus, to experience being completely absorbed in the moment, and a lot of different things that, that people classify as, uh, as a peak experience or, or a spiritual experience, which we can talk about later as we go. Mm. Combat athletics, in my mind, uh, I believe it, it takes it up a different, to a different level and to a different place for a couple different reasons. One mm. is the evolutionary history we have as animals and the you know the intrinsic role that violence has played in our in our evolution it's as it's as integral to our development as homo sapiens as was the accumulation of resources and uh, the acquisition of food and so when you're when you're dealing with another human animal who is trying to, who's struggling with you you know whether it's whether it's wrestling on the mat or fighting in an MMA cage, it has uh, deeply rooted biological uh, effects that you don't, you don't, you're not going to get quite the same experience from surfing or um, climbing a mountain or playing tennis. So number one, I, I believe that you can, you can experience peak experiences and you can use, lots of physical activities as a, as a way to develop yourself and, and progress through Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, number two, I think that individual um, or one-on-one -on -one sports offer those experiences in a way that's a little bit different from team sports. And, and team sports are also fantastic and have their own lessons to teach, especially for young people and about teamwork and, and relationships and dealing with other people. But um, it is different when it's just you in the wave or just you in the mountain or just you and another tennis player across the court. And then if we take it to one other notch, then it becomes a, a I believe an even more powerful thing or has the potential to become an even more powerful thing mm. in the activity you're engaged in when the other is another person who's actually fighting with you. Mm. And so for all those reasons and more, um, combat sports can certainly be a way in which people have peak experiences and a way in which um, they can develop themselves and become better, better human beings. It's not a guarantee. It's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a, a morally neutral activity. It, it doesn't mean that that's going to happen or, mm. uh, you know, people can be, can be training and, and 
never recognize any of that, but the potential is certainly there. Mm. What's very, sorry, what's very interesting for me is you mentioned Joseph Campbell. Mm -hmm. That's like the person who's on my mind and obviously his work a lot uh, all the time. And uh, uh, I was just curious whether you are uh, referring to him or to his message of the hero's journey from time to time, or is it just, just, just came out in, in this conversation? No, Joseph Campbell has had a big impact on the way I think. I remember reading um, Hero of a Thousand Faces when mm. I was probably, um, you know, 20, 21 years old. Mm. And, uh, and that had a deep impact on me. And, and I've, uh, I, I think I've read most of, most of what he's written. And uh, I'm certainly a fan, yeah. Mm. Great, because, well, I'm just, just thinking about it as even the channel's name of of this of my channel is martial arts journey the hero's journey it's it's sometimes i feel that martial arts is, is a fascinating way to experience that journey so i was wondering if, if, if you refer to that sometimes as well i do i do right cool uh so uh another question i wanted to ask and this is related to the moment uh which you brought up as you spoke uh and which which i find very interesting and fascinating and that's what i want to um, ask more about is a lot of the, as we even spoke in the previous conversation, recorded conversation, a lot of the BJJ MMA people that I met were really great people, but at yeah. the same time, it's not really a guarantee. And no. uh, so I, I'm just wondering what do you feel makes the difference, whether the person will transform and grow as an individual, become this great version of himself or not through the means of combat sports. Uh, the way I would phrase that is uh, combat athletics can, can be a, uh, an essential vehicle for self-development, but it's, it's certainly not a guarantee and I don't think it's sufficient. So it's, it, it, in terms of if you wanted to use martial arts mm. as a vehicle for self-actualization, mm. um, I believe that the, the, fact that that martial art is functional, that that martial art at its core is true and sincere and it, and it works, in other words, a combat sport and not a fantasy-based martial art, I believe that criteria is necessary but not sufficient for you to then use that as a vehicle. So I don't think you can even begin stepping onto the path of self-actualization through martial arts if the martial art you're training is fantasy based because the whole thing from the very beginning is, is based in a kind of make believe and it lends itself to, uh, you know, delusion and then people having to defend a position that's more or less indefensible, which is not usually good for people's personalities. Um, combat sports can be a vehicle because you're dealing with the opponent process. You're dealing with an alive opponent is very real. It's going to humble you. It's going to teach you what you can and can't do. You're going to, by the very nature of the activity itself, be forced into states of flow in various times where, you know, things are occurring too rapidly for you to consciously think about them. And, and you kind of have to let yourself go and let you, let your body play the game. And so it lends itself to what could be a vehicle for self-actualization, it, but it's not sufficient uh, for you also have to have the other qualities of being the type of human being that's even interested in that subject. You know, there, are, I, I, I do think I've competitors as a whole that I've met over the last almost three decades tend to be very nice people uh, mm -hmm. and tend to be humbler and and um, then I find in traditional martial arts which a lot of people might be surprised by but I actually I actually find them to be a lot more humble and a lot more approachable usually than the, than the traditional martial arts expert but of course you're gonna run into people who haven't matured or people who are jerks or you know even the occasional violent criminal there's people in federal prisons now that are, you know, training MMA and jujitsu for the sole purpose of when they get out, they'll be able to use it against a police officer or somebody else. So uh, I would call combat athletics a necessary but not sufficient part of what's required for self-actualization through martial arts. Mm. So that actually very nicely leads to my next question, and hopefully that'll help answer that for me, uh, is in terms of values uh, of martial arts, if a person wants to make sure that um, his combat sports uh, practice or martial arts uh, facilitates that personal growth, that it helps the person become the better version of himself, 
uh, would you feel uh, having a set of values and focusing on them, whether it's the gym, which gives it as a guideline or the personal or, or the person has it as personal guidelines, some values to focus on while training that helps facilitate that? Do you think there, there are these values? Yeah, no, there's definitely those values. I can give you a long or short answer to that. You know, my short answer is yes. Um, I definitely mm -hmm. think values play an, an important role. Mm. My, lo my longer answer would be, I would be wary of, uh, let's say you were somebody who's interested in training combat sports for all the reasons that we're talking about, which is probably mm. a percentage of the people that are going to listen to this podcast. Yeah. And let's also say for sake of argument, they're not ar already in an academy or a gym that um, lends itself to that, mm. to that journey. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have to go out and start looking for for a tribe or for a community or for, for a gym or an academy that, that will allow them to step on that path. Mm. Um, in that circumstance, I would be wary of walking into an academy or a martial arts school, whether it's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu school or makes martial arts academy, that made too much of the spiritual journey, too much of the self-actualization part of it in their marketing, in, the, in their culture, mm -hmm. in the way the coaches uh, spoke and dealt with each other on the mat, that would be a little bit disconcerting for me because <laughs> yeah. for the, and I'm going to, I'm going to guess probably for the same reasons you dislike the term spiritual as do yes. I, yes. but it, it very, that very quickly can, can become something weird where you've got, you know, it's a guru trap for the, for the people that are facilitating that environment and for the people who are in it, following that environment <laughs> and a healthy makes martial arts gym or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu school that will lend itself to a path of self actualization. It's going to be a place where you walk in and the men and women that are training are mature, are kind, um, are interested in, in training hard, but not hurting anybody. Mm -hmm. And you feel welcome and you feel comfortable. And in that kind of environment, that's, that's all you need because the activity itself will take you along that path. You don't, you don't need to have long conversations about it. You don't need to have, um, sit in front of somebody who's going to lecture you about it. You just need to be in a place where the, the other people around you are, are mature, intelligent, and kind. And it's that culture will come from the top down. So as hopefully the instructors and then through the students and, and in that environment, martial arts, just combat, uh, sports, functional martial arts, just tend to lend themselves uh, to becoming vehicles for self-actualization. You're just going, you're going to become more comfortable with yourself in spite of all the other s spiritual trappings you find in, in, you know, some of the fantasy based martial arts that talk about being spiritual all the time. Mm. And so, so my advice for people that are interested in that is you want to find a school where, where the other instructors and the other athletes are mature and kind, and that's all you need. And then, Everything after that is just the activity itself, rolling on the mat, sparring with your sparring partners. Mm. The actual activity itself, the doing of it is where everything else is going to come from. Mm. That sounds great. That sounds very good. It's, it's something I'm insp uh, inspired about. It sounds very inspiring to me because, as mentioned, the Aikido that I experienced are much of emphasizing all that development uh, I, I both see there's there's some positive notes, but also definitely a lot of negative notes too. But that was sometimes the issue that it would become so intellectualized that a person would develop this idea that he has that he is mature, or he would have this idea of maturity rather than experiencing the transformation to maturity, uh, which for for experience. And I think that's much more powerful. In that right. Way. Mm. Um, and uh, the question that comes from this. Uh, as an instructor, as a professor, uh, do you have, and hopefully this, is, this, this makes sense, this question makes sense, but do you have some kind of a checklist or some kind of way of, of checking that, uh, that this, this would happen in, in your gym, in your surroundings, in your community, uh, kind of some guidelines, or I mean, I guess you, you kind of told, but, but why I'm referring to this, and maybe that question does, doesn't come up because it's so experiential, but as an Aikido instructor, I had to always double check myself if I'm not 
becoming too intellectualized if if I'm I'm presenting what I want the students to experience or if it's just an idea. Do you, do you have to check that to make sure that that space is there? Do you have to hold that space somehow, or is it right? No, that's a that's a good question. Uh, I'll say that uh, just last week I shot uh, my pod. You know, we have our monthly podcast for SBG, mm -hmm. and the podcast that is being released today actually it was a question and answer podcast I did a couple of weeks ago where I just answered a, uh, a lot of the questions that people had sent in to me mm. over the last six months. Mm. And one of them I talk about quite a bit is pretty much what you just asked me in a different, mm. in a different form. So, so people can also go to that podcast to refer to that. Great. But the point I wanted to make, the, the question as it arose from the other person, mm. the way they asked it was, is there a lot of secular martial arts organizations like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Okay. And I, Just I believe that they asked me that question or came up with that question because they must have read other things I've written that are not Jiu Jitsu related and somewhere along the line uh, realized I was an atheist. Mm. And I wanted to make it very clear when I answered that question on the podcast that SBG is not a secular martial arts organization. It's also not a religious martial arts organization mm -hmm. and it's not a political martial arts organization. So when I go to wherever, when I go to Ireland or when I go someplace in the United States or Canada or Africa or wherever I go to teach a seminar mm -hmm. and I'm sitting in there in front of a, a group of people, I know and that those people have, number one, they've given me a weekend of their life. So they've taken time away from family or work or whatever else it is to come spend two days on the mat with me. Number two, they paid usually a pretty good amount of money to be there for two days. And those aren't things that I take lightly. So I feel mm -hmm. a, a strong sense of uh, gratitude for that and, a, and mm -hmm. a responsibility to be professional. So they're not paying me to sit there on the mat with them and talk about politics or who I think should be president or Buddhism or what I think happens after you die or, or what was before the Big Bang. They're not asked. They didn't come to the event for that. Mm. They came to the event to learn functional martial arts for me. Mm. So it's really, really important to me that I honor that. And so SPG is a martial arts organization that's dedicated towards truth in combat. That's what I, that's how it started. And mm. that's what it remains. And everything that falls within that spectrum, which is everything from um, one of our instructors in Chicago, Paul Sharp, that you just recently talked to, mm -hmm. has a program for teaching martial arts to uh, autistic kids. Mm -hmm. um, at the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, instructors who are working with uh, military, and, and mm -hmm. then we have instructors that work with law enforcement. Then we have instructors who are focused on getting competitors ready for jiu-jitsu, high-level jiu-jitsu tournaments. Mm -hmm. and then we have people like John Cavanaugh, who's getting fighters ready for the highest level uh, events that exist in our sport in MMA and everything in between. So if, if what you're talking about is related to functional martial arts, the organization is involved in it and incorporated in that. If we look at a lot of the coaches, my, my black belts and coaching staff, there's certainly a lot of atheists. There's also Christians. There's also um, Muslims in our organization. There's also Buddhists in our organization. So when I'm on the mat and I'm with my students or, or my instructors, I don't care whether they're Buddhist or atheist or Christian. I don't care whether they're conservative or um, liberal. None of those things matter. But what does matter, just to bring it full circle back to the mm -hmm. way you asked me the question, mm -hmm. are the values that those people hold. And one of the mm -hmm. things <clears throat> I realized, I think, myself, mostly over the last 10 years of my life, Mm. has been that the people who are very close to me and the people that I try and surround myself with, they may have very different political views from me. Many of them have very different religious views from me. But what we do all have in common are those values. And we don't sit around and talk about those values. You know, we don't sit around and, and have a checklist for those values. Mm -hmm. Nobody's being evaluated on those values. <laughs> I just know that those men and women um, believe it's important to be a good husband or a good wife. I know that those men and women um, put their kids first before anything else. I know that if I have to go somewhere in an emergency, I could leave my daughters with them and they would be fine. Mm -hmm. I know that they believe in hard work um, and, you know, on and on it goes. And those values, as far as, as being a good human being, being a good parent, um, 
putting your family first, making sure you work hard and that you're a good and productive citizen and member of society, those values, they underlie the, how we behave and you can, you can see it in their behavior, which is what matters. It's not what they talk about or it's, it's how they behave that ma matters. And those transcend things like your particular belief on the social policy or mm -hmm. what, I, what I think may happen after people die. Mm -hmm. And by having a gym, if we just go back to what I said at, at the beginning, where the instructors are mature and mm -hmm. kind, and if, if they're following those two guidelines and they're professional at what they do, you know, they're showing up on time, they're teaching a good class, they're, they actually care about the material they're teaching and, and, and they put their students first when they're teaching class. The class isn't about them and showing off for what they can or can't do. The class is, hey, let, I wanna really sincerely help these people that are in front of me for the next hour or 90 minutes to get good at this activity that they paid me for. If the people are consistent with those things, the values I just mentioned, we are automatically probably gonna wind up sharing. You know, you're not going to have somebody who uh, who's doesn't take parenting seriously or uh, who, who is terrible to their spouse uh, and, and have them be in a community like that and last. Not because we wind up beating them up or kicking them out, but just because <laughs> over, over time you just don't mesh with people like that, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't share those, those values that underlie it. But mm -hmm. So we have rules at the gym, like, uh, you know, don't, don't roll rough, don't train rough. If I have to tell you what that means, that's, you're, you're already a problem, right? Um, and those are the guidelines we have for the gym, but I don't have a specific list of, of values, but I will say that over time, you, pretty, you find out that the, the instructors and the coaches and the people that you have around you, if you, if you sit down with them after class mm. and you have a long conversation of that, uh, that goes past the superficial and gets to important topics, you'll find that they all share those values. Um, so one thing which I was very inspired from as far as we got to know each other, uh, and you just kind of mentioned it, uh, that pretty much all of your black belts that you've grown uh, have actually stayed with you for like years and years. Uh, yeah. For me, straight away, again, I, I always, well, I mean, I'm doomed to compare my, my previous experience with this new world that I'm entering, uh, the traditional martial arts world, uh, both Aikido and other martial arts. Uh, that was so often not the case, like just organizations would fall apart, all these quote unquote betrayals would happen, or even in instructors, the, that, that would drive me crazy sometimes. The head instructors would talk about how to uh, have a good relationship in your family and they would get separated. It's just like this mess, uh, which right. not everyone addressed. And th that was the crazy part because they right. would believe what they would say, but they wouldn't see that why they are not doing that themselves. Uh, right. But just coming back actually to the essence of, of all that, why I was impressed and what I wanted to ask, and maybe it's connected to what you just said, probably, but uh, how, how, what do you think this was the essence of you being able to maintain this this huge big community without all these all these all this trouble that I just spoke about. Yeah, um, you know, anytime you have a big enough group of people in an or organization like we have that's all over the world, and there's lots and lots of different instructors, and and if and if you talk about my black belts, black belts, and now we're into the third generation, so their black belts, black belts. There's a lot of instructors, a lot of people, and, and there's always going to be some sort of um, issue between human beings. That's just the nature of, <laughs> mm -hmm. of socializing. Mm. But I would feel, you know, you, you mentioned the lectures and things like that, and then you'd see hypocrisy or incongruency <laughs> in, the, in the instructor's behavior. Mm -hmm. I have, have certainly far from being a perfect human being, and <laughs> I have done incredibly embarrassing and... Um, things that I, you know, that, that I regret, of course, over my life. I'm 49 years old. And, and certainly when I was younger that I made lots and lots of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And given that, and given my own personal failings, I would feel kind of ridiculous sitting in front of any group and moralizing to them about what they should or shouldn't do mm -hmm. beyond what needs to be said in that moment on the mat about how you should or should not treat your training partner so that you mm -hmm. can both grow together. 
Mm -hmm. And sitting in front of a group of human beings that are the instructors in SBG, I'd feel even more ridiculous for a couple of reasons. One, they know me, they've known me a long time. So many of them knew me back when I would drink a lot more and be, be, mm. could be an asshole. <laughs> and two, they're all, you know, super high quality human beings, men and women who I, in many ways, admire. And so mm. I would find it, uh, awkward to have that kind of conversation. And mm. I also find it unnecessary um, because like I said, the activity itself lends itself to a certain kind of authenticity. Mm -hmm. So when you're not having those kind of conversations and you're, and you're not really what, what you, what it's all about is, is the actual thing we do, which is functional martial arts. Mm -hmm. And everybody tends to be mature and kind. There is not a lot of reason for people to, want to leave or go anywhere else. They, these are people that they've been with for 10, 15, 20 years. By the time they mm -hmm. receive a black belt, you know, they've probably trained with that, that part of the SPG organization for at least a decade, often longer. And they have this longstanding deep relationships with people that they've, that they've wrestled with. You know, these, these are a room full of people that they've, they've all mutually tried to choke each other and, <laughs> and tap each other. And, and it, it lends itself to, to powerful relationships and that's a lot to throw away so the only time really where it's rare but on an occasional circumstance where i've had to let a coach go or or someone decides to move on, somebody that um, a safety issue was somebody that i felt was was behaving um inappropriately on the mat or a behavioral issue if somebody's not um running their business in a way that's ethical or, or steals or something like that, then obviously we have to get rid of them. Those circumstances are extraordinarily rare. Mm -hmm. so, so barring those kind of events, there's not a lot of reason for people to move on. You know? And if I ran, I, I will say one more thing as it relates to that. If I ran Matt Thornton's Brazilian Jiu Jitsu organization, mm -hmm. I, I could see over time where some people would want to come out maybe from underneath my shadow and then they'd want to run you know, Joe Smith's martial arts organization or Joe Smith's yeah. Academy. But right. what I run is SBG. And though mm -hmm. I, I founded the organization 25 years ago, I am far from being its, its, um, its most prominent coach. My, my black belts have certainly overtaken uh, whatever fame I have. And many of them in their own uh, respective fields have accomplished things much greater than I've accomplished. And I'm proud of that. That's the way it's supposed to be. You know, I don't want my black belts to accomplish less than I've accomplished any more than I want my kids to accomplish less than I've accomplished. I want my kids to go beyond anywhere I've ever gone. And I want my black belts to go beyond anywhere I've ever gone. Mm -hmm. And so they're representing, they're not representing me. They're representing SBG and I represent SBG and, and the students we have in Africa represent SBG. And that's a big banner that's not related to one person. If I get in a car accident tomorrow and I'm gone, SPG is still going to be there and it's still going to be filled with world-class coaches. So the, the way that I, that, that we've, the organization that has been created by all the original members is, exists also beyond pers any individual's personality. And I think that I'm probably being a little long-winded here, but I think oh, that also, um, it, it lends itself to not having a lot of people go you know, right. because they're perfectly happy to follow my example and give credit and value to the organization as a whole, rather than just themselves as an individual. I think also when once people mature, which takes longer for some, for some than others, it certainly took me a long, a long time to mature a little bit, but once we mature, I think we realize it also feels better to give credit to something bigger than yourself. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. That sounds great. Uh, so actually, in terms of maturity, uh, whether there is an answer here or not, uh, do, do you, would you define maturity somehow? Because I find it a, a yeah. bit of, it's a tricky word. It's not easy sometimes for people. Yeah, I, uh, I actually wound up having to give a fairly clear definition of that in the book that I've been, that I'm always hmm. finished with. But nice. the book I was writing because I, I my personal uh, belief and from my research over the years, I believe that the lack of maturity as I would describe it is, is one mm. of the 
the major factors in problematic violence, whether we're talking about assaults or even homicides. Right. And so the way I would define maturity is it's, it's kind of a, a measurement of, that's likely to admit to ever increasing complexity of three key components. And the first one is self-awareness, empathy, mm. and impulse control. Mm. Mm -hmm. Self-awareness, empathy, and impulse control. And, and all three of them, but certainly the um, empathy and impulse control are all related to prefrontal cortex functions. And so anytime you have someone that has a severe prefrontal cortex damage or is born with a, a prefrontal cortex that doesn't operate quite the same way or, or, or as well as it otherwise would normatively, then you're going to wind up with um, a higher propensity towards um, aggression, higher, higher poten uh, potential for, um, for violence. Mm -hmm. But as we age and as we mature, we become more aware of how our behavior is affecting other people, more aware of our own the places in our own lives where our ego is interjecting and, you know, and, and, and we're behaving ridiculously because of something silly. And, and that, I think I can't think of a better term for that than, than self-awareness. Mm. We also become better at being able to realize how other people might be feeling as we get more experience in our lives. We, we all tend to have a little bit more empathy usually if we're growing in the right direction, because we can say to ourselves, man, if I, I, I've been there before or I can recognize, you know, how, the, how this person might be suffering or dealing with this right now. And then hopefully, again, if we're if we're growing in the right direction, we we gain uh, better levels of impulse control or discipline in our lives. And I think it's the combination, the interplay between that impulse control, that that empathy, being able to put ourselves in the shoes of other human beings and a certain awareness of our own failings. Uh, that would be how I would define maturity. Mm. Great. Cool. Now, something I wanted to come back to uh, in terms of what we spoke about, uh, you mentioned family quite a few times. It's, it's yeah. something I'm discovering myself lately. <laughs> but I think probably for many people, it's even if we specifically look at uh, combat athletics, uh, it's it's hard sometimes for people relationships are in generally in general just it's a difficult realm i believe yeah. uh, but some people have trouble like wives are upset about husbands going too much to the gym maybe yeah. vice versa happens uh but it does sound like family you see that it's it does have to be a priority in life uh yes would, would you so how do you think if, if a person is having this conflict of finding balance between family and, uh, and his combat athletics, uh, could you say something, what would you say to that, such a person? Would you have some advice for him? Conflict in that uh, their training is negatively impacting their family or they don't, that kind of thing? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. That, that's one of, one um, of the cases. You know, in that in that kind of circumstance, if it was somebody I was close with, I'd probably take them out after class one night or or one afternoon and sit down with them and have a heart to heart conversation with them and and see what's going on and and I would I would just try and be sincere and speak to them from my own personal experience of what I feel comfortable saying and what I would feel comfortable saying is you know I have been in a failed marriage. This is my wife Salome and I have been together for ten years, but. Prior to that, I was married and I had two sons with my previous wife mm -hmm. and she and I get along good now, but I certainly wasn't a, um, wasn't a model husband mm -hmm. and I wasn't happy. And although Salome and I have had our differences over the years, we have a pretty great relationship, but I, I would tell that person or whoever I was talking to, you know, it wasn't easy. It, have, being in a good marriage is hard. It's hard work. And mm -hmm. be, it, it's interesting because the value of that, of marriage, the value of that relationship is directly in proportion to the fact that it's hard work. Things mm -hmm. that are hard, that are hard work that are hard to accomplish. Those are the things that are valuable. And I, I would just say, you know, in general, it's worth every bit of that work, if not more, because, um, when you do reach a place in your relationship where you can both communicate honestly with each other and, and, uh, and respect and love each other's, um, wishes and, 
it's it's a phenomenal thing and it's certainly what you want as a as a base of operations if you're going to raise kids so um you know i would i would talk to the person about that i would try and find out you know what's bothering them and and i would i would encourage them you know the best thing in those kind of circumstances honestly is when uh, whether it's the wife or husband, when the spouse comes in and starts training too. <laughs> and we have a lot of, we've had a lot of that over the years. I've seen that happen lots of times where, you know, either the wife or husband gets tired of like, why is this, why is my spouse going to the gym like three days a week or four days a week? And and then it, then it starts to become a, an even bigger part of the person's life because then they're involved socially with other members of the gym and, they, mm-hmm. and they'll go to functions or they want to go, uh, watch the, the other athletes from the gym fight at one of the events on Saturday night or whatever. <laughs> and it becomes such a big part of that person's life that it almost becomes weird if the, if the spouse either does it at least trains or if they don't train, you know, they, they come along and attend those functions with and support their, um, mm. their other half. So generally speaking, I've, I've seen that happen many, many times and, and that, you know, that's my, that's my preference. I love the fact that my wife trains. She'll be taking my class tonight. Well, she'll get babysitters so she can come, mm. come take my class. And, and it, it only brings us closer together. Nice. Nice. So I, I would presume it's safe to say from your perspective that uh, uh, sometimes the, um, in, in, in terms of sometimes combat athletes or even martial artists, they sacrifice the family for that idea that, I need to achieve this. This is very important and I need to devote myself and they sacrifice family for that, their right. family health. So it's not the way to go, I would say. No. Good. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, you can compare it, the role of, in particular, I think, a father very closely in many ways to the role of a coach. And if, if you teach long enough, if you teach martial arts long enough, you coach long enough, you realize that whether you want it or not, you're going to be uh, perceived in many ways as a father figure by your students, especially the young, young men sometimes. There's just no way around it. And with, with that, there comes a certain amount of responsibility in that you can say something to them that, you, do, you know, maybe a little bit flippant. You, you weren't paying that much attention. You didn't mean much by it, but you could say something that's um, hurtful. And, mm-hmm. and, but not something, you know, you, just casually and that person will hate you forever. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or you can, you can say uh, even a very mild compliment and you realize later on that it meant so much to that, to that other person. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily think that's always healthy, but mm-hmm. I do think that, um, it's also not healthy to deny that happens and to just kind of you know, ignore mm-hmm. the whole phenomena. So along with that comes a certain kind of responsibility, a responsibility to behave professionally in the gym, a responsibility to try as much as possible to model what you would hope uh, they would behave like in certain circumstances and mm-hmm. to put their growth ahead of your own. So mm-hmm. when I come in and teach a class, if I, if I say, you know, man, I'm just, I had a bad day, you know, my kids are, give me a hard time, whatever it is. So I'm, I'm going to roll for the first 40 minutes of class so I can, I can mm-hmm. get a little bit of my aggression out and feel better. Mm-hmm. Um, that's very selfish from the standpoint of being a coach. While I'm mm-hmm. there for that class, my job mm-hmm. is to make the people in that class better and to mm-hmm. put them ahead of my own interest at that moment. Mm-hmm. And it is very much the same thing with, with your kids and with your family. Mm. And if you, if you don't put your kids well-being and your kids welfare and your kids safety ahead of your, your own needs or wants, it's, uh, it would be very hard for me to respect people that don't do that. It's very hard for me to, um, to look past that. And I also know from my own personal experience, when I was a younger father in my very early twenties, mm. that it doesn't, it, it's not a, it's not a good place to go. It's not going to make you feel better. It's not going to, it's not going to lend itself to a happy life. You may, you may think you're living the rock star life now, mm. and, but I, I will, I will promise you that as the years go by, you'll look back and you'll wish that you had spent more time with those kids and less time doing whatever else you, you were doing at the time that you thought was more important. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so that's, 
and I think it's very, it's, it's the same with the students. You know, you may, you may do all this sparring and this rolling and this training for yourself when mm -hmm. you're supposed to be being a coach. But I will promise you that when the years go by and you look back, you will wish you had paid more attention and given more of yourself to the students as opposed to yourself. Because mm -hmm. it goes back to what I said earlier about the organization. In the end, we all, I think all of us as we mature realize it just lends itself to, to, to being, having a, a happier life when you, when you focus on other people instead of focusing on yourself. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. definitely. And I'm, I'm very happy you're, you're emphasizing family and, and also giving to others and looking after for others. Uh, it's, it's a fresh realization for me that family should be a priority on a top level uh, and that if I don't keep take care of my family, then everything else will, will not have the same value. So right. I'm very happy you're, you're emphasizing that. Uh, I, well, in terms of priorities, I wanted to ask... Uh, just to, because I admire the way you think and you look at things and, and I always, uh, in these cases, I, I, I always know that it's in, in a person that I can admire, that person has a, a set of looking, a perspective, a set of way of looking at things or uh, kind of framing them in his life that, that is different. And so I would like to uh, ask you, in terms of your priorities, obviously family is on a high level, but if I could ask you, if there's some ladder, if there would be a ladder of priorities, uh, could you say a few levels of um, how you prioritize things in, in your life? Sure. Um, my family comes before anything else. My, my kids mm -hmm. and my marriage is the most important thing. Um, after that, I think my, uh, my relationships, my other close relationships in my life, my, my friends and, and, mm -hmm. and people, men and women that are, that are close to me in that way. And along with that comes my own health, because if I don't take care of myself and my health, then I'm not going to be there for my kids as they grow and, and need me. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after that comes um, my business and taking mm -hmm. care of the organization. And, and that's how I support my family. And, and also now I have, you know, uh, a lot of coaches that work with me and, and work for me and a lot of, coaches around the world that kind of rely on, on SBG as, as a way to feed their families. So I have a kind of fiduciary responsibility to, to my own personal gym and to the organization as a whole to make sure that that's running smoothly and, and we're growing in a, in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once we get past that, then yeah, everything else is so, so much more unimportant than anything I just listed. It almost, it almost doesn't belong on the same list. You know? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. After that, then we get to my own jujitsu game or, mm -hmm. um, you know, finishing the book that I've been working on. And those mm -hmm. things are, they're important to me, but they're, they're so far below all this other stuff that, um, you know, I, I would be uncomfortable even putting it on the same piece of paper. <laughs> sure. I, I, I see that. Cool. Uh, now, one of the last questions in terms of this realm before I move move to the next uh, to the next one. Um, there is a, the case of burnout, and yep. uh, I would like to address it on two levels. So, on an athlete's life, in terms of uh, just which I experienced from time to time as well, just burning myself out through my practice, which would influence then my personal life as well. But then the results would get lower, and there's that desire to push yourself to become better, but I feel there's a line after which is crossed, it, it can almost uh, do the opposite. And so, so if, we, if we could start, if I could start by asking you about the, the athlete's burnout of training sure. too much, uh, how, how would you suggest for a person to avoid that or come out of that or just the whole, the whole question? Right. Uh, two things. So, I would differentiate between competitive athletes that are, are actively competing in the sport, which I'll talk about in a minute, and people who are the hobbyists who are beginning training or, you know, actively engaged, but they have full-time jobs, they have families, things like that. Mm -hmm. so from the perspective of a hobbyist, I changed um, the way that we sign people up here at my gym about eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And the way we used to do it is you, anybody could walk in, they would sign up and, and you could pay for unlimited classes and you could come as much as you wanted and you just paid, you know, a few dollars more to do that. Mm -hmm. And I got rid of that. And instead I put, um, when you first sign up here at the gym and certainly for this, the first six weeks, 
you can't attend the gym more than two days a week. You can't take, <laughs> you can't take more than two classes. Mm -hmm. And those classes, unless you have a strong background uh, previously, those classes are going to be specifically designed foundation classes mm -hmm. that are there to help build you up um, and teach you the what you need to know before you move on and get into um, other parts of our, our sports. Mm -hmm. And I did that for a couple of reasons. And the first one is, People, especially in the beginning, it's almost like a, some of the instructors, I've heard them talk about it as white belt itis, but people come in, they first start training jujitsu, they, they fall in love with it because that, it, it, I believe from my own perspective, it's very easy to fall in love with Brazilian jujitsu mm -hmm. and, um, and then they just train too much. You know, mm -hmm. they're training two days, three days, four days, five days a week and they burn out and pretty soon after four or five weeks, you, you never see that person again. <laughs> and that is incredibly common. It's incredibly mm -hmm. common. And so by making them only come, allowing them to only come two days a week, I'm protecting them to build them up before I, uh, to build their bodies up to make sure they're capable of doing more. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also preventing them from burning out because my concern is not to just, you know, take their money and give them as much as I can in a short period of time. My concern is I want to keep that person on the mat until they become a black belt and beyond. And, and that means, you know, more than 10 years I want them here. And so this is a lot. Jiu-jitsu is a long-term journey. It's not a sport you learn in one, two, three, four, even five years. Mm -hmm. And I also don't think that people really start playing jujitsu. um, Really, you don't really even start learning jujitsu uh, at the deeper levels until you become a black belt. And mm -hmm. so, it all, it, from that seen from that perspective, mm -hmm. it almost takes ten or twelve years before you even start getting into the, you know, the even funner part of what we do. Mm -hmm. And so, that's a long journey, and that requires long term planning. So, mm -hmm. in the beginning, we we limit the amount of time they're training. And for any anybody that's listening to the podcast, if you go to a school that allows unlimited classes or whatever, I would tell you, um, for the first three or four months you train. Mm -hmm. Do it only two days a week, even if you want to do more. And mm -hmm. then after that, then raise it to three or four days a week. And then after that, evaluate how your body's doing. But mm -hmm. if you're uh, an average human being who is not on performance enhancing drugs, there is a point where you will burn out. And like, as you said, it becomes counterproductive. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, you can read about that online and find out what the warning clues are and you can mm -hmm. adjust your diet and you can, create a conditioning program and do other things to ward that off and, and give yourself as much training time as possible. But even still, especially if you have a job and, and other commitments, mm -hmm. um, you're going to be very limited in how much you can train and you don't want to, you know, you don't want to make it a counterproductive activity mm -hmm. for professional athletes. It's different because they're not going to have most of, many of them don't have um, a lot of the other commitments. They're, they're used to training more. But even there, to be honest, um, it's a struggle sometimes. Mm -hmm. I ha I've, I've had a lot more difficulty in my career getting my athletes to not overtrain than I have <laughs> getting them to show up to practice. Yeah. You know, I, I've, heard, I've heard these stories about how in certain sports, you know, it can be hard to get the athlete to show up to practice, but I've never <laughs> experienced that myself. <laughs> what I have experienced is having to go up to the athlete and say, listen, you are – over training you train three days today you train three days yesterday i can you you just you can tell they feel like they're walking around with a with a flu all the time because they're just pushing their body too hard mm -hmm. and uh and you have to sit down and, and have a conversation with them and, and to be honest with you that becomes a, at least in my experience that's been harder as a coach mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to deal with so so it's part of do you feel it's part of the respon uh, responsibility of the coach to also stop the student and just tell him it is your your number one responsibility as a coach and, and to dovetail back to what i was saying before i also believe this is the number one responsibility of a, of a father but mm -hmm. your number one responsibility is the health and safety of that person mm. them getting good at the skill uh, their goals or you know, or your mutual goals as it relates to whatever competitions or things that they want to accomplish, those are second to their health and safety. And mm -hmm. if you're a coach and you don't put the health and safety of your students on the mat before anything else, then you're a bad coach. And so that means, you know, 
uh, interfering when there's somebody on the mat that has, looks like they might be hurting other people, interfering when there's somebody on the mat that looks like they uh, might be making people uncomfortable with their behavior uh, in, a, in, a not, in not a good way, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in, interfering when somebody's overtraining, interfering when somebody's doing an activity that can lend itself to injury because they're doing it improperly. That's one of the reasons why I tell my coaches I don't want them rolling in with the class. Their training time is before or after the class is over. But, you know, last night I ran competition team for, the, for my athletes, but I don't, I don't roll during competition team unless there's another black belt there and I pass the responsibility on to them for a moment mm -hmm. because I have to be the eyes on the mat standing up, looking around and making sure that nobody's getting hurt. Nobody mm -hmm. runs into anybody else. Nobody's – no two athletes are ramping it up and, and they're going too hard and it's getting – you know, they're, one of them's going to get hurt. Those kind of things, that's my number one responsibility. Mm -hmm. I see. And in terms of uh, you're running a business, you're, you're supervising a, a big community, your gym, and there's the family. So uh, personally, I mean, I do this and that, and I – experience burnout from time to time i yeah. i would imagine you you had some experience of burnouts sometime in the past or at least that question comes up so could you say a few words on how do you feel it's what's what's the way to handle life burnouts in terms of like regular uh, burnouts yeah uh in the beginning, so for new gym owners, somebody that goes to a, a, a town and they open up a SBG school and, the, and they're first starting up, it's a lot. And mm -hmm. um, I tell my coaches, and especially if they have families, and, and sometimes even it's some, you know married couples that will be opening up the business together, but I mean, you have to expect that you're going to be working 60, 70, 80 hours a week because mm -hmm. you're not going to have a staff and you have to answer the phones and you have to um, – sign everybody up and you have to meet, greet everybody at the door and you have to teach all the classes and, and do all the follow-up calls and manage your marketing and pay all the bill, all that stuff. But then over time, and you know, I've been here teaching in Portland. I've had this, my school here for 25 years. So at this point I have a large staff. And so I'm in a, in a privileged position that I worked very hard for where, you know, I, I don't have to be at the gym every day. I don't even have to be at the gym more than a couple days a week unless I want to. I am, but I don't have to. And mm -hmm. if I decide I'm going to take the family and we're going to go, you know, on a road trip and go to Montana and Idaho for a week or 10 days, like I did recently, mm. everything runs smoothly. Mm -hmm. But, but it took me a long time. It took me years to build up the staff and people for that. So mm -hmm. in the short term, if you're running a business and you're starting, you're just starting out, you're going to have to understand and prepare for some sacrifices and, mm -hmm. you know, you and your spouse would have to sit down and think hard about that and, and plan out the time and come up with a schedule to make sure that the kids are still first and mm -hmm. getting everything they need. And oftentimes mm -hmm. that means having the kids at the gym with you. But, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want people to go into that naively and think that um, it's going to be easy. It's very, very hard when you first start out to, to, to juggle those priorities. But over time, um, if you do make that sacrifice as the years go by, you get to a point where I'm at now where I can spend, I spend, a, I think a lot more time with my kids now than most parents get to spend with their children because most parents have to work. Most dads have to work 40 hours a week, right? At least. Mm -hmm. And then they see them in the evening or in the morning. I see my kids all the time. My kids are here at the gym with me and we homeschool. So this morning I was, you know, working with my, my daughter uh, on her school and then I'll tomorrow I'll spend all day with them. So mm. yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, you, know, I yeah. you, just have, you just have to go into the activity eyes wide open about what it's going to involve. And, and you, and you know, it could be very much that you and your wife say, or whoever it is says, you know what, we realize how much work this is going to be and we're going to mm. wait until our kids are, eight or nine before we open up a gym or, you know, teenagers or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, actually in terms of that business, so this, this question probably doesn't apply to, to a big percentage of people. I think it's an important one in terms of building the staff, in terms of building a gym. Uh, I, ha I have this feeling or even from my experience that 
just running a gym year by year, being being the the code the main coach doesn't necessarily make the staff appear and happen. And uh, is it? Do you think, or would you say it is something that grows up eventually, uh, or or do you have to consciously invest and make sure that that kind of of setting is there where you don't have to be always there and you don't have to do everything 100% yourself is it something you have to consciously try to do and and build up or yeah. or yeah that's a good question and yeah 100% is something you consciously have to do so one of my biggest pet peeves about martial arts and and actually brazilian jiu jitsu in particular i i think we've talked about this before but mm -hmm. uh, the assumption that because you you are good at these at the martial art itself. So you're, you're good at the sport of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or the, the art of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu that therefore you can then teach is a fallacy. Yeah. And some of the, some of the worst coaches I've ever met, some of the worst teachers I've ever met have been, you know, world champion competitors. Mm -hmm. and, I, and at the same time, I've watched cl uh, classes that have been taught by purple belts that are just phenomenal. And mm -hmm. I, and I, and I think to myself, man, I would I'd kind of like to take that class, you know, <laughs> and, And so having said that, years ago, we created at SBG, we created an instructor training program. And so mm. everybody that's on my staff right now, currently at my gym in Portland has gone through the instructor course. And that course is several hours um, on Saturdays over, I, I, I believe it's nine or 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. So they, they wind up getting you know, whatever it is, 40 or 50 hours of instruction. And mm. that instruction is solely on how to teach class. It's not, we're not there about to try and make them good at, at jujitsu on those classes. It's, it's everything from presentation to how do you handle problems? If somebody mm. has an in injury on the mat to what's the, what's the good class format and how much time should you allot for each aspect of the class, everything. Mm -hmm. They graduate from that, uh, course assuming they graduate we don't graduate everybody they have to they have to actually know the material and mm -hmm. we test them on the material they get up in front of the class and they teach mm -hmm. they create their own class and they have to teach it to, to to the instructors assuming they graduate from that then they go on to a they shadow one of the other coaches that's on my uh on my schedule now for 100 hours so they will oh. spend 100 hours or with that coach just being their helper and helping the students um, at the, in that class after that they're eligible to get on the schedule oh. <laughs> now I've been running those courses for um, and by the way I should say all that is assuming they're they are good because you also have to be good at what at at the sure. martial art of course yeah. but that, like like I said before with um, with self-actualization being good at the martial art is a necessary but not sufficient component to being good right. at teaching right. and so all the Right now, I have a uh, full schedule, and I have uh, helpers for everybody that's on the schedule, and I have a waiting list of coaches who want, would like to get on staff. Hmm. And, but that's taken years. And we, you know, mm -hmm. every year we run that program, and every year we, have, we accept 12 to 15 people, and they go through this process. So we're, we're always building uh, staff. And I, that's the way it's done at the other SBGs as well around the – around the United States and around the world. In fact, Travis Davis and one of my black belts will go to Ireland and teach the instructor program there in a condensed version over several, uh, you know, full days, eight hour days yeah. mm. uh, every year for the people there. So mm. it, that it takes conscious effort and you have to create a program like that and you have to be, uh, do it consistently. But if you do that, then of course the, you wind up, with this awesome community of trained mm. staff who teach great classes. And in the long run, that all benefits, not just, not just myself and the students, but it also benefits the finances of the gym because people come in and they like the way the classes are taught. They're less mm -hmm. apt to quit. Right. Yeah, sure. Um, sounds very good. <laughs> uh, I, uh, just to double check, do we still have 10 more minutes or? Sure. Yeah, okay. that's fine. Great. So because I just, before I ask the last question, I wanted to sneak in another, another one. In the beginning of our conversation, you mentioned flow and yeah. uh, kind of that state of flow, I, I presume as well. But uh, I heard this come up in BGG conversation from time to time. So I'm not sure if it's, if it's a common term, but could you tell a bit more about that flow? Uh, what, what is it exactly? 
Yeah, well, the, I would go back probably to a definition that was used by Abraham Maslow when he talked about peak experiences. But, but a peak experience is a moment where you become so absorbed in the doing of whatever act, the activity is that, that you're involved in at that moment that the sense of self and other even the sense of time disappears. Hmm. And, um, you know, people can have peak experiences through all kinds of things and, and they're by no means whatsoever limited to martial arts. But mm -hmm. I do think that functional martial arts lend themselves to that. And mm. it, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in particular lends itself to that happening for a couple different reasons. And one is just the intensity of, of wrestling with another human being and, the, the pace at which it occurs, if you're thinking, like I said before, about this move comes and then I have to do this or then I have to do that, your, your body won't respond in time. You'll be too slow. And everything in jujitsu, when it comes to winning and, and um, surviving and winning on the mat, has to do with timing. Mm. And so the very activity itself lends itself to if you can find a way to put yourself in that state of deep concentration, you're going to perform better. So over time, athletes, whether they know it or not, hmm. kind of start um, modifying and adapting what they do mentally and physically in order to accommodate uh, falling into that state of flow. Hmm. And jujitsu also, you can, that happens with boxing, that happens with, that can happen with any functional sport, but as I've said before, the beautiful part about jujitsu is you can do it more and harder than you can the other sports because you're not going to get pain damage and you're not going to get smashed and you're not going to, you know, get a, you know, it's, it's safer, mm -hmm. less, less, uh, less physical impact. So you could come in three, four days a week and wrestle one or two hours uh, each time and still be very healthy. And, mm -hmm. and the longer you do jujitsu, the more apt you are, especially if you have a good training partner who gives you a good game, the more apt you are to just kind of fall into that state of flow while you're rolling. And that becomes incredibly pleasurable for people. And you'll mm -hmm. see this is what drives people, I think, to continue coming back to train jujitsu. And this is why people um, just love the sport and they'll want to come in two, three, four days a week because it's such a massive stress reliever for them to be able to have an experience like that where they can lose themselves for, for an hour, get a great workout and walk off the mat and, and everything in their life just feels better and in, and in a better context at the very least after doing it. So right. yeah, that's what I would say about that. And that you mentioned, you kind of mentioned, you feel it does translate to life, at least on some level. And that was my, my, my curiosity wanted to go there and ask, do you feel that state somehow transmits to, to professional life or daily life or that kind of flow state? Or would you think, would you say that's a bit too far stretched in terms of having, finding that relationship between daily life and practice on, on the no, I think it lends itself to everything you do and uh, in the same way that meditation does. And in many ways, we're talking about the, the exact same thing. So ultimately, in most forms of, of meditation, what you're looking to do is to cease identifying with the consistent flow of thoughts that go on in your head, right? Right. And, and some people will, will talk about that as not thinking, but really I think not thinking is probably not the best way to describe it because it's not yeah. as if mm -hmm. the human being stops thinking what it is, is right. the human being stops at least for a moment attaching to the thoughts or as the, uh, the individual that's producing the thoughts, you see them more as just of course like clouds in the sky floating by and, and the lack of attachment lends itself to um, feeling better, um, relieving stress, uh, being more able to concentrate and and do whatever it is it requires doing in your life uh, happier uh, more compassionate uh, smarter I mean all these things are benefits that people can get from from meditation when it's done well and and by by decoupling uh, unhooking themselves to you know the wagon of neurotic thoughts that many people wind up lugging around with them all day mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you can find a 
you can achieve that. And, and I think I would even go so far as to say most people who train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for any period of long period of time do wind up achieving that without trying. It just happens when you do it. And then the, the more that happens and the more accustomed they become to that happening, I think the more apt you are to be able to do that in a daily meditation practice or in your daily life when all of a sudden you start feeling stressed or you just want to be present with your kids. Mm -hmm. So um, absolutely, I think it, it can translate into everything you do if you're, if you're mindful of it. Mm. And because I don't, I don't want to hold the conversation for too long. And there's one more question I want to ask. So just as a brief answer, uh, it doesn't have to be a long one, but is, would you say meditation is a, a big part of your life? Is it, is, does it place, play an important part in your life? Like a specific uh, meditation as a practice, as a specific practice? Uh, no, I wouldn't uh, say n not meditation as people would think of meditation where, uh, where you would sit in, as you would in typical Zen okay. practice. So more of a state of mind than a, a relationship with thoughts. It's not like that sitting cross feet and having your hands together, etc. No, I, what I try and what I try and do is to be mindful in my daily life while I'm engaged in whatever I'm doing. If I'm washing dishes or if I'm mm. walking my dog right. or I'm taking my kids to the park to be mindful and to, to not lose myself in my own internal dialogue. Right. For me, for me, that's my practice and I found it helpful. I do occasionally sit and just do that kind of meditation, but I don't want, I don't want to mislead people into thinking that it's something I do every day. Mm. Uh, and uh, although I probably should <laughs> I've often thought about, it, I just have not done that. Okay. Because it just piqued my curiosity because you, you mentioned the term meditation and I was just wondering whether it's, it's one way or the other, but, but whatever you said sounds, sounds great enough. So. So cool. Well, the last question, uh, which I also wrote down in that list. Uh, so the, the D2D, the W2W, um, yes. Wim to Warrior program. Yeah. Uh, by the time this podcast will be released, I will not have yet announced the, the, my big plan, but, but it's not a secret on this podcast. But just could you tell a bit about that program and whether... People will know sure. yeah. It's a program that was started in uh, Australia by a gentleman named Richie Cranny. Um, I first saw it when I was in Ireland. Uh, I'm terrible with time, but I think it was probably, <laughs> um, I'm just going to say four, three or four years ago. Mm. And I was, I was on one of my trips in Ireland and, and John Cavanaugh had told me that he'd been running this program and he wanted me to take a look at it. And so while I was there, I watched it. And then uh, the culmination, the end of the of a winter warrior season, the students fight. So they actually have an MMA fight. They're wearing headgear and um, shin pads and it's a, it's a full event. So you have, they sell tickets and there's an audience mm -hmm. and there's a, there's a cage and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the graduation fight, I guess you could call it along with John and we watched mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, it was interesting cause he said to me, I think knowing me, he, th I, I think that when you first heard about this program, you would not like it. And he was correct. Oh, wow. initially, initially, my first thoughts on it were not positive uh -huh. uh, because I, I generally don't like programs where people come in and train just for a short period of time, whether it's mm. uh, mm. six or eight weeks or something like that. And then they're done. And also mm -hmm. fighting MMA is something that I think, we need to take very seriously because of traumatic brain injury. And, sure. yeah. and so usually I only encourage, I don't encourage anyone to fight MMA, but, <laughs> but for someone to, someone to fight MMA at our gym, they have to really want to do it. Um, and then, then we'll take the steps to prepare them for it. But it's not something that I would ever push people into. I, mm -hmm. I encourage people to train and compete in jujitsu because you're not getting hit in the head, but MMA mm -hmm. is because but then he said, I think after you watch the, the fight and you see the program, you're going to like it. Mm -hmm. So I went with an open mind. I watched the fight. I saw the program and he was 100% correct. And he was correct mm -hmm. for a couple different reasons. Um, the way it's done is, is very healthy and it's a way that I can, I can um, fully endorse. So the, the health and safety of the athletes is uh, highest priority. 
Um, even the fights, the it was an actual fight, but John was very, very careful. The referee was very, very careful. There was never a moment where I felt anybody was going to get hurt or somebody had fallen mm. or hit the mat, and the other person was just continually throwing blows. These are fights mm-hmm. that were stopped early, that were mm. stopped appropriately. Um, mm-hmm. All the athletes um, looked like they belonged there. They were all in shape. They were all ready to do it. And so what I realized pretty quickly is it it's a transformative experience. Mm-hmm. And then here's, here's the big thing also that helped um, convince me. Most of those people then went on to continue training. Mm-hmm. They didn't just stop. So mm-hmm. then they, they went on and continued with their career. So after the fights, I sat down and I talked to some of the, the athletes that had gone through the program. And to a person, they were all um, excited and talking about how transformative the experience had been for them. Mm-hmm. And they'd come in. And not the whole point of the program is these are not fighters. These are not amateur boxers or, you know, NCAA wrestlers. These are people who have, you know, accountants and, mm. and day jobs and they're older, middle-aged often and men or women. Um, and they just want to experience what it's like to train for a fight and to do a fight. And the training is no joke. So my coach, the head of my MMA team in Portland, Rick mm. Davidson, who's my senior black belt here, he runs that program along with our boxing coach, um, Brian Walsh. And the two of them take it very seriously. And it's early in the morning and it's several hours. And it's every day. And, mm. if, and uh, you know, it, it's hard, hard work. Mm-hmm. But at the end of that, it, it just was a, a fantastic experience for everybody that did it. So that, that, Convince me we've run we've run one season we were the first school in the united states mm. to run a season here uh last year it was a very positive experience for everybody that did it and we're getting ready to do another one here in i believe in um september october and i'm excited because uh i think it's a great program great and uh, if anyone is interested is it on your website or do you still have spaces to register for for people Yes. So we haven't actually done the tryouts yet. We will have tryouts and people can email us. Um, we will have information for it on our website. We've put it up in the newsletters. Probably the simplest thing is for people just to go to straightblastgym.com, click mm. on contact us, send us an email um, and tell us a little bit about yourself, where you live, uh, your age, weight, and your past experience. And you know, we'll get back in contact with you. Right now, what we're doing is we're creating a, a list, a waiting list. And then for the people who are in the area, um, we'll have them come in and, and do tryouts. We'll, and we'll um, make sure that they're assess them physically and mentally, make sure they're mm-hmm. okay, ready mm-hmm. for the program. And then, then we'll get started. Great. And the very, very last, very last thing, uh, just for the audience, if uh, from Europe, uh, you, if this is not a secret, otherwise I'll cut it out, but I would guess not. So you're coming to Europe in end of September. Correct. Yeah. Coming to the European camp that's held every year at, at John Cavanaugh's gym in Dublin, Ireland. Great. And so probably you'll find the information on the website as well when they check it. Yeah. Straightblastgym.com or SBG Ireland. Um, and for anybody that's considering going to that, I would highly recommend it. You get to train with me, you get to train with John Cavanaugh mm. and um, other black belts. Travis Davison is usually there as well. And um, I think they'll really enjoy it. It's, it's an awesome group of of people and and dublin's just a fun city anyway right it's just a blast so cool great well that that's that wraps up my questions uh thank you very much again for for being here again and i'm sure people will benefit from from this these answers and conversation very much and so thank you for that yeah thanks for having me it's a pleasure